Hi, it's Robin. When you're using computers, especially if you were using computers since the 80s or 70s even, there'd be a lot of times where it's just not working the way you expect it to. You think maybe your computer's broken, but turns out it's just that you're not using it correctly. Sometimes you probably should have known better, and then other times where you think, how would anybody ever know that? Well, without being told. So I've got a bunch of examples on the Commodore 64 of things like this, they, they all happen to me. I'm not just making these up. <laughs> so I'll go through them, starting with the simplest ones. This one, for example, you start your computer and you go to load, and you know you want to load your directory, and you get a mess like that. And you press return, you try to fix it. it goes the wrong direction. It's all messed up. Well, you might have spotted it. The shift lock key was on when I started. And unlike modern computers which have a caps lock key, this shifts all the characters. So of course, to fix that, just <laughs> remove the shift lock and that operates the way you expected it to. So that one's pretty obvious, but if you happen to have a cartridge like a super snapshot, I'll plug that in now. Now on the Super Snapshot boot screen, you're supposed to press delete to exit to BASIC. Well, in this case, nothing's happening. This actually happened to me while I was preparing for this episode. I had left shift lock on because I was doing the example. And then basically the keyboard appears broken, but it's just that shift lock is on, that the screen is unresponsive. That's how it should work. Now here's another one. You've got your computer on and you start typing on it. And you see, one key went wrong there. Just try typing the alphabet here. Whoops. So what's going on this time? Check your joystick ports. And here I've got a joystick with auto fire and the auto fire is switched on. And this is exactly what will happen if you have auto fire on. Even in joystick port 2, it will mess up your keyboard. And especially, I'm going to switch it to joystick port 1, which you may have heard interferes with the Commodore keyboard. I'll reset the computer. And if auto fire is on here, this is what happens. <laughs> so if you turn on your computer and it's doing this, hopefully it's just auto fire. So even with auto fire off, if the joystick was lying around under a table, might have some books on it, might be tipped over if the joystick's being moved or fire's held down. By the way, that problem with the auto fire happens because the joystick ports and the keyboard share the same input output chips. So you can get a lot of interference, especially if you use port one, but even in port two sometimes. And it's because of the interference in port one that most later C64 games default to joystick port 2. Maybe I'll explain that more thoroughly in another video sometime. So another problem, maybe you're playing some uh, Jack Attack or whatever. As you do, and then you want to reset the computer. Now I've got a reset switch here on my EX3. Uh, back in the old days, I would use a paper clip on user port pins 1 and 3, but I don't really recommend that. I'm not going to try and do that here for the camera. <laughs> anyway, so here, I'll just press my reset button. And the computer does not reset, just the game resets. And depending on your Commodore, sometimes even powering off your computer and back on again won't fix this. Well, that time it crashed. But if you turn it off for a longer period, it'll come back. Now, apparently some models of C64C have a Fujitsu RAM chip in them that has such memory persistence, you can turn it off for minutes. And that particular reset problem will still occur. Whatever was resident in memory 
will still be present and prevent the computer from starting up. If I can track down one of those Fujitsu C64s, I'll show you that myself. But what's happening is that certain games have a magic sequence in memory that spells out CBM80 at location 8004. When the computer is turned on, the kernel scans memory for that sequence and jumps to the address at location 8000 hex and executes it. That's actually there so that cartridge games will auto boot, but the kernel doesn't care if a cartridge is inserted. It just looks at memory. So even if you poke those values into RAM in the absence of a cartridge, that same effect happens. So if you turn your computer off for long enough, sometimes just a couple seconds, on most models of Commodore 64, but certain revisions, you may have to turn it off for, <laughs> for many minutes. The computer will come back to operation. Or if you happen to have a utility cartridge that does an XROM reset, like a Super Snapshot or other utility cartridge, then you can avoid that problem. Some games actually use that as copy protection to deter hackers from getting in. Thanks to Sven Peterson, for some research on that. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll go deeper into that in a future episode. We'll say it's 1991 and you bought yourself a nice copy of Ultima 6 for your Commodore 64. And you happen to have two disk drives. Ultima 6 comes on three disks, each double-sided. So that's six disk sides. So it seems like a perfect game for dual drives to cut down disk swapping. Well, you go ahead and boot it. The way I have this configures drive 8, and this one is drive 9. And this happens, it just endlessly spins. You might think the game is broken, but you turn off the computer and turn off your second drive, drive 9. By the way, this is a Commodore 1541-2 disk drive, which is more or less compatible with the original 1541. Most games worked fine on it. The main advantage of the 1541-2 was easier to change the device number on. It actually has a couple dip switches on the back. And the power supply is external, so it runs cooler as well. So anyway, if we turn off drive 9 here. And we slowed it again. You should hear that music and see that the drive light's actually blinking. So it's loading properly. It turns out that Ultima 6 for the Commodore 64 doesn't support multiple drives. In fact, it won't even boot if you have more than one drive active. So that's pretty terrible. Especially considering that Ultima 4 support multiple drives. And that was from 1985. Now this is one of the worst examples of this, but I don't believe it's the only one. I've heard that some games don't work if you have a printer attached, multiple drives, and certainly a bunch of games won't load if you have a super snapshot or other utility cartridge like a fast load or so on. And some of those cases, that's the programmers deliberately trying to discourage you from using extra equipment. And in other cases, it's just, I, I suppose, from lack of testing. Thanks to Eric W. Brown on Twitter, who suggests I try Ultima 6 for this example. Say it's 1984, and you just bought your first Commodore disk drive, and you try to make a copy of Karotica, because, you know, your friend brought it over. And then you run your copy. And you hear kind of a funny sound, but the game doesn't work. So you turn off your disk drive, turn off your computer. Turn it back on again, and then try to load a disk directory or whatever. And you get this, file not found. 
and you know that disc was working. So you even turn it off, turn it on again. As cooked, I'll even try this Ultima disc just to further prove it. It is done for. Every disc you try, you get that error. This is exactly what happened to me in 1984 when my disk drive was just <laughs> probably days old. And I freaked out. Power cycling did not do anything for it. So I started reading the manual. I started typing every command I could find in that in the desperate hope something would work. And then I finally stumbled on this one. I for initialize. After those lovely machine gun sounds. My disk drive started working again, and I swore I would never copy another game again. Well, that was a lie. I did. So, what's going on with this one? Well, we're going to look inside the disk drive. I'll show you how this one works. There's four screws on the bottom of the disk drive I've already removed. We'll take the lid off, plug this back in, power up the drive. Under here, that white area with the black stripe across it, that is the disk drive head. Actually, notice it's pointing up. I think a lot of people don't realize that when you're looking at a disk, you figure this is the front side here, but it's actually, when you stick this side label up, it's actually reading the back side because the head is under. So if we stick this disk in, okay, so we will load Borker. Hey, thanks to Adrian Gonzalez for pointing me towards this program. It's a modified version of a program from the book Inside Commodore DOS on page 105. And on line 160 is where we tell it what track to access. A normal Commodore disk has 35 tracks, although the mechanism can actually read up to track 40. Track 1 is on the outside, and track 40 is here. Now if we change this to track 1 and run it, watch the track, it's going to move away from the camera. Okay, first it went to track 18, because that was it currently knows where track 18 is. And then it moved back to track 1, which is the outer edge of the disk. Now it's displaying. Uh, well, what this program does is it's reading in the bytes that are in that sector that we told it to go to. But we're not using this program for that right now. So track 1. And then normally the maximum is 35. But the mechanism can actually try to go anywhere. Usually up to track 40 is safe. But by the time you get to track 41, 42, then all mechanisms are at the limit. But this is actually unprotected. The computer, oh, I didn't mention that. The 1541 actually has a 6502 processor. It's got RAM in it. It's a complete self-contained computer hooked up over this IEC serial bus, which is a lot like a precursor to USB. And the Atari 8-bits also had a similar setup. So when we go to track 42 and run, the controller will attempt to get to track 42. There we go. Watch it. Here. So it's moved right up to the limit here. Actually, I can take the disk out. I'll power off the drive. I'll turn it back on and watch. Watch the read head here. It's still stuck there. Might as well stick the disc back in. And now if I do a load dollar sign, it tries to move, but it's stuck there. <laughs> now this varies. Some Commodore disk drives will not get stuck at all. It seems to happen more often with these older models that have the latch door. And 
It depends on the drive again. Once it gets stuck, does it need physical intervention to fix it? Or will just that initialize work? So I'll, I'll send that initialize command again. And it should become unstuck just because it tries, I suppose it tries harder to pull the head away. There we go. Okay, and now it's working again. This is a problem that does have a physical component and arguably the drive is broken when you try to seek to track 42. Now, I think in the case of Karotica, it detects that it's a copy and deliberately force the head into this lock position. And boy, did that ever mess me up as a 12-year-old with a shiny new 1541 after uh, after being stuck with a cassette drive. Now there might be another explanation for why that happened. I haven't gone through Karotica uh, and found the drive code that might actually cause this problem, uh, but I know that was my experience at the time, and at least I can prove that in theory it could happen. I'll probably do a full episode on it sometime, but incidentally, this is how you clean your disk drive. Most of them, if you just take off the lid, and then you can lift up, and access that head and you just take a cotton swab dip it in some isopropyl alcohol and of course turn off the disk drive while you do this power remove all power to it and then with that alcohol soaked q-tip just rub it on the head all right thanks for watching thanks as always to my patrons who support me check out my patreon link if you're interested in being a patron there's some benefits listed on the web page and if you haven't already please subscribe and you can click that bell icon for further notifications all right thanks for watching and we'll talk to you next time